Do you want to know the secrets of the secondhand subculture? Everything about auctions, estate sales, appraisals, and downsizing? What about learning how to make some extra money in the resale world? Well, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to Why Don't You Want My Stuff, the podcast hosted by professional appraiser, auctioneer, and the host of YouTube's Last Week at the Auction, Josh Levine. Hey, everybody. We are back. It's Why Don't You Want My Stuff? Why Don't You Want Your Stuff? With Josh Levine. Hey, uh, I got an exciting show today. This is called Making More by Knowing More. And I'm always talking about those genres and niches or niches. I don't niches niches i've never understood i think niche sounds fancier but knowing the genres how's that for a word for you too um the genres that are hot and what's collectible and things outside of the scope of what you normally collect so you're keeping an eye open because there's always opportunities to make money in things that you may not know about so i'm going to talk a little bit about my journey uh in collectibles, a lot of you know I, I got into musical instruments first and finding out their resale value. But my first foray into uh, collectibles was really toys. And further drilling down, it was really board games. All right. Now, that sounds pretty weird. But uh, board games were a niche I found super early that people didn't know anything about. How did I find out? I found out because I went to an auction and bought a box lot of board games because I thought one was cool. It was called Dark Tower, which was, um, I think, Mattel uh, or Milton Bradley, Milton Bradley game that was loosely based on Dungeons and Dragons. And um, it was a very expensive board game when I was a kid, and I remember I couldn't afford it. And a friend of mine had it, and it never worked right, and we could never figure it out. It was kind of a dumb game. But I'm like, oh, somebody will probably collect this. I bought it, you know, bought the box lot for that, bought it and put it on eBay, and it sold for $300. And I was like, wow, mind you, I paid about 5 bucks for the box of games. Well, the other games in the box were, were selling for 30 bucks, 50 bucks, 70 bucks, And what did I always tell you? Those kind of margins are pretty cool, right? 5 bucks and... Now the 300 may be an anomaly, but if you buy for five and sell for 30, you know that's a pretty good living, especially once you get a process down to listing these things and and making your own boxes. I can't believe uh, Priority Mail actually has a board game box. I can't tell you how many board game boxes I made in my life, but it has to be over a thousand board game boxes that I had to custom make for Priority Mail, and then they finally came out with one well after I stopped selling board games, but. Board games in general are something to really study. Uh, sounds really super nerdy, but again, there's there's very few people into them, and it's a very quick, easy way you can buy for three, four dollars and sell for twenty, thirty, forty dollars. And then, of course, there's a lot of scores out there. When you get into some of the games from uh, Gilligan's Island and like really rare TV show board games, some of them still are commanding, you know, five hundred to a thousand dollars plus. So. Keeping an eye out for those, um, again, it's just an easy money maker. So I'd like to point that out. Board games. Um, I'll get it. One of these days, I'm going to do an RPG and get into the really super uh, nerdy games like uh, SPI War Games and Dungeons and Dragons. And of course, we could get into the cards, Magic the Gathering, and Pokemon. But but the bo traditional board games that were based on some of the war games, I once bought the contents of a garage from a woman I think we paid I want to say two thousand dollars and probably sold the contents for about fifty thousand dollars so that was a fun one too so again that was way back in the day that was back in the day that might even been I think that was cuckoo toys or zuzu toys I can't remember which business that was but so board games there's one for you to know um making more knowing more I think that's what I'm going to call this episode I think I've said that so we're going to stick with it uh next would be cameras all right Cameras were another uh, niche that came out of uh, knowing about electronics and collectibles. I was like, oh, you know, maybe some vintage cameras. Again, I learned most of this by, hey, that's so cheap. If I buy it, I can't make a mistake. So, 
you know, at an estate sale, bought a box of old cameras and lenses, didn't know anything about them. But let me tell you, it's quite an education when you search eBay, completed items by highest price sold. Make sure you check those two boxes, completed and sold, and then do some homework. So if you find a Nikon number one, for example, you might have $25,000 if it's in the first 9,000 made. And again, think about that. It's just a Nikon 35 millimeter that might be in somebody's attic. All right. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of cameras, Nikons, uh, there's vintage Minolta's, uh, my gosh, Canons. But the Earlier cameras that you may not know about, some of the old box cameras can be worth quite a bit of money. The older doesn't necessarily mean it's worth more. It's what's desirable. The large format cameras, small, medium format cameras. Uh, brands you may not have heard of, like uh, Hasselblad, may not be a household name to you unless you're a camera aficionado. But again, what happens is somebody may have bought one of these Hasselblad cameras because they're a professional photographer they die. It was in the closet. The family doesn't have a clue or or thinks what everyone else thinks. It's an old camera. Nobody wants it because everything's digital now. I've heard that a million times. I'm glad you think that way because that means you'll put it out the yard sale for $20 or $30. So these are the things to keep an eye out. Some lenses can be worth several thousand dollars. Again, those are the pie in the sky. Now, when I say pie in the sky, I mean, they're out there every weekend at an estate sale in your town. But what I'm looking for is you buy it for five bucks and it's worth 50 bucks. You buy it for five and it's worth 35. You can make a living doing this. And again, improve your process, your process of how you photograph, catalog, and list. Work on that. When you get that down to a science, then these 20 and $30 bills are just is there a $30 bill? There's no such thing as a $30 bill. I shouldn't say that. There probably was in the 19th century. There are some weird currencies. We'll get into that in the show one day. All right, so I talked about cameras a little bit. Next up, I want to talk about um, another one where I used to make a lot of money that people didn't know was costume jewelry. And it was also a great way to get in the house sometimes when someone's having a yard sale or an estate sale, they'll have a bunch of stuff out, but they don't put a lot of smalls out or the things that they don't think anybody will want. And you'll hear the people at a yard sale or estate sale ask the family, they'll say, hey, do you have any uh, gold, silver, or guns? You know, And the people are like, yeah, I want to bring you in my house and show you all my guns. I mean, it's not Usually they're just like, hey, this is what we have at the yard sale. But if you say, you know, I do you have any costume jewelry or board games? That will start a conversation. And costume jewelry, no one, including the jewelers that advertise, we buy gold, we buy silver, they don't, they discount this stuff. They don't even look at it. 99% of them don't have a clue that there can be a great value in costume jewelry. And again, it's learning your names. It's finding out what's hot and what's popular. Use eBay, use WorthPoint, use these tools that are out there. When you find them, get your, if you see a box and they have grandma's old jewelry box and you know the family's pilfered it, they went through looking for all the gold and silver because that's what was worth money. They may even have walked it into the local pawn shop and the pawn shop picked out the gold and the silver and bought that from them for scrap. Now they have, they're left with this jewelry box. And you're like, how much for that whole jewelry box? And they're like, I don't know, 35 bucks. Buy it. Take it home, and there's your class. You take it home, you get out of loop, and look up the names. And you will learn so much. You're going to run into Avon. You're going to run into Monet. And most Avon and Monet is no Monet. They're not, it's not worth much. But the names like Eisenberg, Coro, uh, Miriam Haskell. Um, oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm trying to think of. Weiss. There's so many out. Coro. There's, oh my gosh, there's one that's, uh, oh my gosh, it'll hit me anyway. But there's, there's names out there that if you know, like Miriam Haskell, you can have a necklace that, again, doesn't look like much to you, but three, four hundred dollars. So costume jewelry is really something to keep an eye out for. And again, it's learning those names. And guess what they miss? They miss things like platinum. They miss things like and you would be shocked, but I mean, I've, I even had a jeweler once give us a bag saying this was all silver scrap if I could find anything of any value in it. And I was like, like this platinum tray, because it said 950 
and they assumed the 950 was 950 sterling because some as you know, most sterling's 925, but there's different, some European measurements, some Mexican, some of the uh, uh, Austrian all had different silver content as what they considered what it was silver, percentage of silver. So, and again, knowing those names and, and things like Taxco Mexico, where people think, oh, that's just Mexican silver, nobody wants it. Well, that's really hot, it's mid century. So, you get one strange little brooch. And it can be big money. So we could do a whole show on that. Another thing I want to talk about is fishing lures. There is another place. I knew nothing about fishing lures other than I fished with them. You know, I didn't think anyone would ever collect these. And I was talking to a guy at an, at an estate auction. And I overheard him say he had worked at an auction and saw fishing lures selling for twenty and $30,000. And my ears perked up. So I wanted to know what that was about. So I immediately went home and, and looked up fishing lures on eBay. And I was like, oh my gosh, some of these fishing lures are five and $600 and $800 and $1,200. And I'm like, what is the difference? What are they? What's the brand name? So I start seeing like head in and these trout, uh, these uh, bass fishing lures and trout and the old wooden ones with eye, with glass eyes, with eyes, with glass eyes and the different color variations. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to learn all this in a day, but what I could do is the next time I see a... Um, a tackle box at an estate sale and I say how much do you want for it and they say 50 bucks and it has a bunch of old lures and just buy it so I did so I bought a couple of those and sure enough I became a fishing lure expert honestly I am not I know enough to be dangerous if I see them in an estate sale or yard sale I just pick them up and buy them especially if they're wooden with glass eyes because again you never know you never ever pay for these things if you're paying 30 40 bucks and condition matters you know obviously You'd love them new in the box, but you're not always going to run into that. But that's something to really keep an eye out for. Fishing lures, really rare um, genre for people to have any knowledge about. And again, because a lot of this stuff's been put away for 30, 40 years, and they didn't think anything of it. Also keep an eye out for the reels, the old uh, bamboo um, trout rods are really good. The fly rods are what you're looking for. They can be really, really, really good. So... That said, last one I'm going to go over today, and by the way, I could do this a hundred times, and I probably will give you a bunch of examples like this, but I'm trying to give you the stuff I learned early because they really broadened my horizon. I always try to look for those things people throw away, too, because giving them that knowledge, especially in an estate sale or a yard sale, when you are when you give them like, hey, do you have any, if you say, do you have any fishing lures, they're like, yeah, I think we do in the house. If you get in the house, as we know, sometimes that's where the cool stuff is that, again, people don't see any value or don't think anybody's going to want. Here's one. Perfume bottles. Okay, this is the last one I'm going to go over today. There are some perfume bottles from the 50s and 60s that are worth thousands of dollars, all right, even 20s and 30s as well, the French Lalique. And a lot of these perfume companies made these, you know, the French art glass perfume bottles and there's American companies that made these beautiful little perfume bottles and it is a highly sought after collectible but again it's the first thing someone goes oh why'd my grandmother keep all these perfume bottles in the medicine cabinet and they throw them away so if you can tip them off and say hey before you clean that house out before you throw don't throw anything away because we look for things like costume jewelry, perfume bottles, you know, that could be a lot of hidden value. Now, not all perfume bottles. Again, who's that brand they pick on? Avon. Nobody wants any old Avon perfume bottles. By the way, there are actually a rare few that are actually collectible, very rare f few. I remember I used to try to put the chess set together because they had a whole, you could get all the chess pieces in Avon. And let me tell you, you never forget the smell of Avon if you ever drop one of these bottles at an estate sale. You never forget it. I used to roll up the box truck and go, they got Avon in there, don't they? Because it would just, yeah, it just, it's a smell that's like Play-Doh. You can't get that out of your head. You're like, I remember that. That's Avon and that's Play-Doh. So uh, long story short, this is just a few examples of some genres that I hope tomorrow you go out to an estate sale or a yard sale or a Goodwill or, you know, your local thrift store and, and look at these things a second time and go, 
you know, maybe I'll just pick that up. And maybe you buy it and it's not worth anything. You paid five bucks for that perfume bottle. It's not worth anything, but it sends you down the wormhole and that wormhole is very educational. You're going to learn more and you're going to make more money the next time you go out and buy something. So I'm Josh. This is Why Don't You Want My Stuff? And I hope that helped you today. Thank you guys so much for checking in. Thank you for listening to Why Don't You Want My Stuff with Josh Levine. If you're interested in learning more or becoming an expert, please follow and support the show by rating us on your favorite podcast player. Engage with us. If you have ideas or questions, send an email to josh at joshlevinespeaks.com or you can visit www.joshlevinespeaks.com. We'd love to talk about your question on the show. This has been a T-Door production. Music by RKVC.